Hey guys, today we're going to talk about trends on the periodic table. So there are a lot of trends that we're going to end up seeing. The first one we kind of mentioned is valence electrons. We're going to get a little bit more in depth. So the first thing that you need to know are that there are only two types of elements on the periodic table nowadays. Those two main groups are called the metals and the nonmetals. The left side of the periodic table holds all of the metals and they go from the left column across the periodic table all the way to the zigzag line or the stair step line. And as you move from the left to the right, the elements become less metallic and the far right side of the table consists strictly of nonmetals. So when we look at the periodic table, a large percentage of it, over half of the periodic table, are metal items. They are considered metals even if they are not metal in terms of what we normally think of. Yes, aluminum is up there. Yes, iron is up there and copper is up there. But there are other items that are also considered metal like sodium or calcium that in normal situations we wouldn't think that way. The periodic table is also arranged in vertical columns. So this is the first column that is group one the second column, group two, the third column, group three, all the way across till we reach the 18th column, or group 18. We also have horizontal rows called periods. The first row only holds two elements, the second row holds eight, the third row, the fourth row, etc. Now, the transition metal section, as well as the section at the bottom with the lanthanides and actinides, those follow slightly different rules because even though scandium has begun in the fourth row, this is actually the third row in terms of our electron usage, so it gets kind of confusing. So horizontal periods, vertical groups. And the way that you want to remember this is the horizontal rows being called periods, it's like a calendar. You go through a cycle. So lithium acts a certain way, then beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon. Coming back down to sodium, sodium acts the same way that lithium does. Magnesium acts the same way that beryllium does, etc., etc. So it's called a period because you're going through a cycle, just like the cycle of a week or a year. So as we move across the periodic table, the order of the elements is based on the number of protons in the nucleus of each element. Hydrogen has one proton, helium has two, lithium has three. And as you move from the top left of the periodic table, from hydrogen to the bottom right of the periodic table, near the noble gases, your mass will always increase. So for example, if you have a periodic table, you have the tall column, slightly smaller, transition metals, If we are comparing an element here and here in the same period, but opposite sides of the periodic table, I'm going to want you to be able to tell me that this one is going to have heavier mass because it's farther to the right. If we compare here and here, I want you to be able to tell me that this one has a heavier mass because it's farther down. Now I may compare this location and this location, and in that case, this is again the heavier mass but I will never compare here to here because sometimes they don't follow the mass rules perfectly. So even though the second X is down further, it still may not be a heavier mass than this one. So hydrogen, top left, lightest element. Radon, bottom right, heaviest element. Now there are heavier elements in the transition metal section and we'll talk about those later. Valence electrons is the easiest trend to come across on the periodic table. It is the number of electrons that each element has in the outside shell. So those electrons are super important because they make the bonds. Without those valence electrons, bonds would not occur. So hydrogen and the elements in the first group all have one valence electron. So hydrogen has one valence. Beryllium and everything in the second group has two valence electrons. Now the transition metals in the middle those have anywhere from two to four valence electrons, and there is no pattern to figure it out. So right now, we're not going to use those. We will be using them in bonds later, but for the time being, we're going to ignore them. Then when we have group 13, 
the boron group. This is where we have to begin looking at the ones place of the group number. Boron has three valence electrons. Group 13, the ones place is a three. Carbon, group 14, the ones place is a four. Carbon has four valence electrons, etc., etc. Now the only element that doesn't follow this, aside from transition metals, is helium. Helium is in group 18, but he has a full outside shell when he only has two electrons in that shell. So he acts like the rest of the noble gases, but his shell is full only with two valence electrons. So helium, Ag, would look like beryllium. Atomic radius is the next trend. The radius is measured slightly differently when it comes to different types of elements. In metals, it's half the distance between two nuclei of atoms directly next to each other. So if you have a nucleus and a nucleus, you measure this distance and you divide it by two. So distance divided by two. In nonmetals, it is half the distance between the nuclei of the atoms bonded together. So when you have Cl2, you have one Cl and a second Cl, and it's this distance divided by two. So the distance divided by two is the same idea, but in nonmetals, they are bonded. They are sharing electrons and they have already created a bond. In metals, they're just sitting next to each other. So looking at this photo, we can see some of the ideas of the atomic radius. And I'm gonna talk through the trends using this photo because you can actually visually see it. Okay, as you go from the top to the bottom of the periodic table, your atomic radius is increasing. The reason that that happens is because you are increasing the number of shells of valence electrons. Hydrogen only has one electron, so his radius is teeny tiny. Lithium has a total of three electrons in two separate electron shells. So as we have that drawing, we see that we add a layer. Sodium has 11 total electrons, so now he has three electron shells potassium has four electron shells, and so on and so forth. So as you add those layers, you are increasing the radius. But as we move this way, the number of electrons in that outside shell increases. And when that happens, the attraction from the protons inside the nucleus and the electrons flying around the electron shell becomes larger and larger. And as it becomes larger, it actually makes that shell shrink. So even though sodium's layer all have three electron shells, when we get to argon, that outside shell is so full that there is a strong attraction between the electrons in the outside shell and the protons in the nucleus. And that causes that layering to kind of smush down and become more dense. So instead of having the layers looking like that, Maybe over here, they look like this. A little tighter together, not quite as spread out, a more dense radius. The next one is the ionization energy. An ionization energy is defined as the energy needed to remove an electron from the shell of a gas molecule. So essentially what this means is, how much energy do you need to steal an electron? You use the first ionization energy for the first electron, the second ionization energy for the second electron, third for the third, etc., etc. And as you remove electrons, the energy required always increases. So as we look at this graph, we have all the different noble gases. So helium over here has the atomic number of two. He has a very high ionization energy to steal his electrons. When we drop down to this dot at the bottom, that's actually lithium. Lithium has a much lower energy than beryllium, than boron, than carbon, than nitrogen, than oxygen, than fluorine, and then back up to neon. So it creates kind of these spikes. And lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium all have very low ionization energies because they only have one valence electron. So lithium has the two on the inside shell and the one on the outside shell. It's very easy for us to remove this electron. And I'm a huge nerd and I always compare this to the zombie apocalypse. 
If you're in a zombie apocalypse, you want to be closer to the center of the group or the camp that you're staying in. Because the closer to the center you are, the more protection you have. If you have somebody hanging out near the outskirts, it's easier for zombies to pick them off one at a time than it is for them to work their way all the way into the camp. So as we go across this little increase, lithium is that one lonely person outside near the end of the camp. Then beryllium is a little bit further in. It's a little bit harder to steal him. Boron's pretty close to beryllium. Then carbon is even further in, so it's even further to steal his electrons, etc., etc. So as you go top to bottom, it's easy to steal electrons in the first group because they have one valence electron. The second group is a little bit harder. The third group is a little bit harder. And the noble gases have this huge spike at the top because it is very hard to steal their electrons. In addition, as you go down the periods, lithium versus cesium, cesium actually has six layers. So when cesium is at the bottom, it's easy to take this electron away because not only is he on the outside of the group, but look at all of these layers in between him and the middle. And that's why these numbers are lower than these numbers. The further away from the nucleus you are, the harder it is to hold on to those electrons. So think of it as a magnet. The nucleus only has so much energy to pull those electrons in. And when you're down at six rows of electrons, when you have this outside shell slightly full, you can pull an electron away relatively easily because that pull from the nucleus is low. So ionization energy increases left to right but decreases top to bottom. So again, just showing you real quick, helium has the highest ionization energy, francium has the lowest. So the last thing we're going to talk about is the octet rule. The octet rule states that atoms gain, lose, or share electrons in order to acquire a full set of eight valence electrons. This is useful for predicting this is useful for predicting what kind of ions are going to form when we form bonds. But there are a few exceptions. Hydrogen is the first exception. He has one valence electron, and he wants two in his outside shell. Helium also wants two in his outside shell. And technically, lithium, beryllium, and boron all will lose their valence electrons to go back to helium standard. So hydrogen through boron are the exceptions. They will share, gain, or lose electrons to make an outside shell with two. All right, so when we meet in class tomorrow, we're going to talk about trends on the periodic table. We're going to focus on valence electrons and ionization energies and masses. See you tomorrow.